Uh, Zweed Bevern from uh, the UCLA uh, for his talk uh, on uh, ultraviolet surprises in quantum gravity. You can hear me? No. no. Hello? Yes. Okay, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about ultraviolet surprises in gravity. Uh, and it's work that I've done with the collaborators that are listed there. Uh, so certainly most people in the audience believe that ultraviolet properties are very well understood up to maybe a few minor details. Like maybe at the, uh, the order in perturbation theory where a divergence occurs might be considered a minor detail. But in fact, the main purpose of my talk is to show you that it's actually quite a bit stranger and more subtle than you might think and also the properties are surprisingly good. So the things I want to show you is, first, examples where there are no ultraviolet divergences when, in fact, standard symmetry arguments suggest that they should be divergences. And then, uh, also, what I'm going to show you is, when we do find divergences, their properties are very strange, and they seem to be connected to quantum anomalies. By an anomaly, I mean that the, a, a classical symmetry does not hold at the quantum level. So uh, first, just a couple words about the basic tools that we're going to use to uh, understand quantum gravity. Uh, there's something called the unitarity method, and this is in the context of scattering amplitudes. It's a very powerful way of looking at quantum field theory. And, and uh, at some point, we're going to actually want to get some numbers. So we need to actually do some loop integrals. And for that, we use advanced integration technology, which is developed in quantum chromodynamics. Um, and then I'll say a little bit about something that's extremely powerful. It's a way of mapping gravity into gauge theory. And we call that the duality between color and kinematics. And there's a, a, quite, quite a lot more to the story, which I obviously can't get into here. So first, uh, just a couple words about the non-renormalizability problem of quantum gravity. Um, and in, in fact, I'm in the math session, so you could think of what I'm talking about as a mathematics problem. We, we have Einstein's theory, and we have perturbation theory, and then it's a very simple question. How does the theory behave in the ultraviolet? And it's, it's not a, a theological debate. It's something that you answer by calculating and by uh, various kinds of analyses. So the standard argumentation is that gravity has a, a coupling constant. Where's a pointer? Uh, and gravity has a dimensionful coupling constant. 
Um, and uh, because of a dimensionful coupling constant, if you compare gauge theory, gauge theory to gravity, uh, then what you find is just by simple dimen dimensional analysis, the vertices in these Feynman diagrams have to have a worse behavior in gravity compared to gauge theory, which has a dimensionless coupling constant. And obviously, if you put more momentum in the numerator, then obviously gravity is worse behaved. It's as simple as that. Now, you can get very sophisticated. You can uh, start applying superspace technology, supersymmetry. But at the end of the day, that's basically the argument, that at some point, the diagrams of gravity become very poorly behaved. Now, there's actually a flaw in the argument, which is very obvious. That this, what I just argued about is about individual pieces, individual diagrams, but in fact, we should be looking at physical quantities before you decide how the theory actually behaves. Now, we're going to be looking at a theory called n equals 8 supergravity and other supersymmetric theories. Uh, th these are not uh, good models of the, of the universe, but they're very good theoretical laboratories. Uh, with more supersymmetry, you expect better ultraviolet behavior, and then on top of it, you also expect simplicity. It helps you a lot at the technical level. That was a very nice quote from uh, Stephen Hawking that I'll amuse you with. Uh, he said, back in 1994, it is not clear that general relativity, when combined with various other fields in supergravity theory, cannot give a sensible quantum theory. Reports of the death of supergravity are an exaggeration. And then th this part's kind of amusing. One year, everyone believed that supergravity was finite, meaning ultraviolet finite. The next year, the fashion changed, and everybody said that supergravity was bound to have divergences, even though none had been found. Well, we go 20 years later, and we actually have found one divergence. It's in a theory called n equals 4 supergravity. It's a four-loop divergence. But in fact, as we're going to see, instead of answering Quest, uh, Hawking's comments, it only is going to deepen the mystery, because it has, that divergence has some peculiar properties. OK, so where are the divergences? Well, if you look over the years, people have said various things about where divergences are. It's, uh, back in the uh, mid-80s, they said it would be three loop n equals eight supergravity is where the divergence would be. And then over the years, the opinions changed. Anyway, uh, we've been uh, calculating away and investigating what's really going on. And the, ba the basic answer is that uh, wherever there's predictions, they're invariably wrong. Uh, so here's the latest prediction at n equals 8 supergravity. This is based on symmetry arguments. Uh, we don't know yet, but in fact, it would not be a good bet to say there's a divergence here because the same argumentation that's used to predict a divergence at seven loops in n equals 8 supergravity has already been shown to be incorrect in, uh, at three loops in n equals 4 supergravity or also four loops in n equals 5 supergravity. So these x's are, we've done the calculation so we know the answer. Now there is a place where there is a divergence. We found one. Four loop n equals four, I already mentioned that. But it has a very weird structure. I'll say some more about that. Um, but anyway, it's still the conventional wisdom if you took a poll of people who think about these things. Uh, they would say, oh yeah, but there's going to be a divergence sooner or later. Now, why is it so hard to check this? Well, if you took standard technology, standard ways of thinking about it from Feynman diagrams, it gets pretty hopeless pretty fast. For example, uh, you can do some kind of counting of how many terms you get. Three loops, you're talking 10 to the 20th. Five loops, 10 to the 31, which, by the way, is more atoms than in your brain, so calculation doesn't fit in your head, so you can't do it. Um, I, I counted it in some way, but you can count any way you want. Apply superspace or whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, the, the conclusion is that these calculations are utterly hopeless if you use standard technology, standard ways of thinking about it. Ooh, that's not good. Oh, hmm. Okay. Now, um, <coughs> my... Huh. What was that? Uh, 
sorry. Just sorry about that. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, might there be new structures, or new, new, new structures in quantum gravity that maybe show that the standard ideas um, need some modification? Actually, I lost track of the time. When did I start? Um, anyway, the answer to that is yes. Okay. Um, the, the, the answer to that is yes. Um, and it's this duality between color and kinematics, which is the relationship between gauge theory and gravity. And this is actually a key structure having to do with the ultraviolet properties. Uh, and the basic idea is the following. Um, if, you look at, if, if, if you look at gauge theory, then uh, there's color factors. So these are, uh, th these are Lie algebra factors. And they obey what's called the Jacobi identity. So this, is, this, this uh, relationship is just the Jacobi identity. So we have a conjecture that the kinematic numerators, that means the dynamics of the theory, also is a relationship that's exactly the same, the same algebraic structure. And you'll say, okay, that's very nice, but what are you going to do with it? And the answer is, what we do with it is we use it to convert gauge theory to gravity theory. If this conjecture is satisfied, if you can find examples like that where it works, then if you want to go between gauge theory and gravity, you just take the color factor, replace it with a kinematic numerator. And in this way, you get gravity loop integrands for free. It's like magic. You do the square root of the work to get gravity. Now, uh, some of the advanced technology, this unitarity method, is used to make sure that whatever the conjecture is, it works in the specific case that we're looking at. Okay, and we can relate uh, uh, n equals, uh, let's say, we can use this to, let's say, get n equals 8 supergravity from n equals 4 super yang mills theory, two copies of it, so we call it double copy or n equals 5 supergravity from n equals 4 supergravity and n equals 1 super yang, sorry, from n equals 4 super yang mills and n equals 1 super yang mills, or n equals 4 supergravity, we get it from n equals 4 super yang mills in ordinary yang mills theory, same type of yang mills that you use in quantum chromodynamics. And the key thing is it's a new structure that we can exploit, and it's a structure that tells us about the ultraviolet. But the most important thing is now we can answer questions directly. There's no more debate, no more religious belief. You just do the calculation. The impossible calculations are now doable. And it's actually been applied to various other things, including classical black hole solutions. Ten minutes? Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, people have made various predictions about where the ultraviolet divergences are. There's various formalisms. There's one from uh, Bjornsson and Green, which I like a lot because it exposes all the supersymmetry. And using that, you can make various predictions about where divergences are, like n equals 8 supergravity diverges at 5 loops, and d equals 24 fifths. Don't worry, we're theorists. We can work in any dimension we like, or, and various other predictions. Now, what's... Now, what's true and what's false? Well, okay, we don't actually know these two, but again, the same arguments that are used to predict this, predict in n equals 4 supergravity, there's a three-loop divergence in four dimensions, and that we know is false because we calculated it. And when this happens, there's a phenomenon, we call it enhanced cancellations. It's something specific to gravity that we do not find in gauge theory. And just to show you a little bit about one example of one of these enhanced cancellations. So let's look at n equals 4 supergravity. That's given by n equals 4 super yang mills times n equals 0 yang mills, meaning ordinary yang mills theory with no supersymmetry. You, you put it, uh, one of, this one we put into a representation called the BCJ representation. That's where this duality between color and kinematics is satisfied. Take uh, pure yang mills replace the color factor with this numerator factor, and magically we get n equals 4 supergravity. We then do the calculation and make a long story short. You calculate all the pieces, 
And if you have a quick calculator, you can add it all up and you'll see there is no divergence. All these divergences, these 1 over epsilons, they represent divergences. All the, all the divergences cancel. Now, of course, my friends, my supergravity friends, when they saw this, they were very concerned and they tried very hard to find a sim standard symmetry explanation. But uh, so far, no such symmetry explanation. In fact, I don't think it's going to be found because these enhanced cancellations are beyond the standard supersymmetry cancellations. Okay, here's an example of a divergence that we actually found. So you can attack this problem from two ends. One end is to look for cancellations. The other one is to study divergences when you find it. So we, we went on to do four loops in this theory, one more loop. That was a little bit more complicated. That was, uh, you could say, professional grade. We had to use in industrial strength software. There's something called Fire 5 written by uh, Alexander Smirnov and also C++ code. Uh, it's uh, a little bit like doing a for loop beta function in QCD, so it's not trivial. And, and the bottom line is this. You, yes, you do find a divergence, but it has strange properties. It's connected to a quantum anomaly. That's what we found. And in fact, this, diver this divergence, it has some very odd properties that if you put the internal legs in four dimensions and you're sloppy with dimensional regularization, you in fact get zero. There's no divergence. Uh, and in fact, this anomaly-like behavior, you don't find it in the supergravities like N equals 8 supergravity. If there is a divergence in N equals 8 supergravity, the one thing I'm sure of, it's not this kind of divergence. Okay, so uh, the next thing is to, 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 to try to um, find, you know, un understand exactly what's going on. It turns out this is a little tough. Well, maybe not. It turns out it's kind of obvious it's a little tough. That's a, that's a for-loop divergence. So you want a simpler example. The simplest example of a divergence is pure Einstein gravity. That was uh, known. Uh, pure Einstein gravity has been studied uh, very well uh, since the 70s at Tufte and Veltman. They looked at one loop. Uh, and what they found is something a little bit strange that, in fact, there's no one-loop divergence in pure Einstein gravity because you can make field redefinitions to remove the Ricci square terms. There's a Gauss-Binet theorem, which then allows you to eliminate the Riemann square term. So, in fact, there's no possible divergence that you can write down. Now, if you have a non-trivial topology, this Gauss-Binet term, uh, that, that, that would be uh, the, uh, actually the form of the divergence that you get with non-trivial topology, it has some curious properties. It's, it comes from what's known as a conformal anomaly. It's, it has something to do with the conformal scaling of the theory and strange behavior. These numbers are, in fact, numbers that have to do with the conformal anomaly for the different types of particles. So we're looking at different particles there. Now, it has this evanescent property. If you put this in d equals 4, like four space-time dimensions, you're going to get zero if it's a topologically trivial space. But if in dimensional regularization, that's not exactly right. You're supposed to use four minus two epsilon dimensions. We call these operators evanescent. And the place they become interesting is, is at two loops, when you start looking at two loops. Now, two loops is also very well understood. Uh, Goroff and Sognati calculated the two-loop divergence. You can see there's a, that the 1 over epsilon that rep represents the divergence. There's a funny number, this 209. And if you look at the surface of this, it looks like there's nothing funny going on here. But in fact, I'm going to show you when you start probing a little deeper, it is quite funny what goes on. The first thing you notice when you do this calculation is that um, uh, that, that um, uh, uh, the divergence appears at an amplitude with identical helicity. When you look at the unitarity cuts of that amplitude, and you're a little sloppy with the dimensional regularization that you put these internal legs in four dimensions, you will get zero. Not only zero for the divergence, you'll just get zero, period. And this, has, this was pointed out by Bardeen and Kanjemi. Actually, it was in gauge theory. They pointed out that, in fact, this is connected to an anomaly in self-dual symmetries. So again, uh, there's something strange going on with this, uh, with, with this you could say, standard divergence of quantum gravity. 
is it's not generic, but it appears to be tied to an anomaly. It's a little bit peculiar. In fact, it gets even stranger when you repeat, we repeated their calculation of, of this Garf and Sognati, and if you do it, if you track the pieces, for technical reasons, they couldn't track exactly the pieces, you find that in fact, this evanescent operator, this Gauss-Bonnet operator, it plays an essential role as a subdivergence. And that's how you repeat their calculation. Okay, I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. Uh, and again, the thing is, it's linked to this conformal anomaly. Okay. Now, um, there's a good probe of the theory when you look at uh, three forms. Um, because three forms don't carry any dynamical degrees of freedom. So you, you think you could add it to the theory without really altering the theory, at least in perturbation theory. Uh, actually, the three form is it's dual to a cosmological constant, so it could have some very important implications. But at least in perturbation theory, it shouldn't do anything. But when you look carefully, in fact, you find it changes the ultraviolet divergence. There's the ultraviolet divergence. You change the number of three forms, that number changes. That's pretty weird. But there's even something weirder that happens. When you look at the renormalization scale dependence, then it does not change. The renormalization scale dependence, that in a, in a sense is the much more physical part of, of uh, the divergence. It's, it tells you the way that the coupling constant scales. That's independent of the three forms. So you get something very strange that happens, is that uh, the divergence, it, it uh, depends on the, Gauss-Bonnet term, that's the, this, this evanescent operator. It depends on these evanescent fields, meaning they don't really carry dynamical degrees of freedom. They change the ultraviolet divergence, but at the end, there's no physical effect. So in a sense, we're looking at the wrong thing. This last slide. Um, we're looking at the wrong thing. Instead of looking at the divergence, what we should be looking at is the renormalization scale dependence. And that has a much nicer behavior. You can see there's no weird numbers. Uh, in fact, the renormalization scale dependence through two loops of gravity is just the number of bosons minus the number of fermions divided by eight times some kinematic factor. Um, and in fact, this vanishes in a supersymmetric theory as it should at two loops. Uh, and uh, it, it's, this, it's this quantity that's really controlling the non-renormalizability. And for sure, it's this quantity, not the divergence that we should be thinking about when we go to higher loops. And the key punchline is that the ultraviolet properties of gravity, they're actually quite subtle and interesting. And here's my summary. Okay, so the first thing is there's a relationship between gravity and gauge theory that we exploit, not only for understanding its, the ultraviolet structure, but to help us do the calculation, that we can answer questions not by blah, blah, but by actually calculating. It's a very powerful tool. And certainly the standard view of, of gravity ultraviolet, it's much too naive. First, we found this an, uh, phenomenon of enhanced ultraviolet cancellation in certain supergravity theories, like three loop n equals four supergravity. Uh, the known divergences of pure gravity, or even pure, pure supergravity, they have anomaly-like behavior. It's very odd. Uh, and, and then also the divergences, they depend on these evanescent fields and operators, and also what are called duality transformations. So that's taking the three form to the cosmological constant. Um, and, but then at the end, the way it works out, once you do the renormalization, then the physics is independent of, of, of these types of issues of the evanescent fields or the duality transformations. Uh, and uh, clearly we should be focusing on the renormalization scale dependence rather than the actual divergences. And they're not the same. And that happens because of these evanescent properties. Uh, so uh, the final punchline is ultraviolet divergences of gravity, they're, it's much better than expected. And the behavior of the gravity under duality transformations, it's kind of surprising. And the meaning of the, of the divergences is also a little bit surprising. Uh, and one thing for sure, as we probe gravity using the modern perturbative tools, we should expect more surprises. Thank you. A question there, please. Yes, or whoever. Yeah. Good.
of what of ghosts? Ghost, yes. No, there's no ghosts. It's it's we're just we're just doing uh, ordinary gravity. So yes. there's no ghosts. Uh, no, no, th those are just count. Those are already part of the theory. So we're not adding anything to the theory. These are just uh, potential counter terms that we're talking about, a potential local counter terms. So they're already in the theory. Uh, th th in fact, the formalism we use makes the unitarity absolutely manifest. You know, like the name unitarity method says, we, we never add any anything else to the theory of gravity. Uh,